Let me very introduce Roy, who is an old friend of mine, but is also a very distinguished journalist. Just working backwards, he's currently Professor of Journalism at City University in London, which has a very large and prestigious journalism school. Less prestigious now I've left, but struggling Absolutely. along. Um, but he's also, I'm sure most of you know, probably the preeminent media commentator in Britain today. He has a compelling um, slot on the Media Guardian, a very prominent slot as, pro as their main commentator. He also has a similar prominent slot in the Evening Standard. But the re and the reason he has that, he is an expert. He's written what I think is the best contemporary history of the British press, called the Press Gang. And don't be put off by it. It's a very thick book, but it's very, it's very racily written, as you'd expect from what I can describe as a tabloid journalist, but in, 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 as, a, in, as a compliment. Because um, um, Moy and I also sit on the British Journalism Review um, editorial board, where we sometimes even agree. Um, prior to that, Roy is great. His, he was an editor of the Daily Mirror. That is a very distinguished position to have in British journalism. Um, the editors of the Daily Mirror, um, main, I'm, I'm not, with some exceptions, have been some of the giants of British journalism. Roy is not an exception. Worked through, started on local newspapers. I'm not going to give his bio, but I'll just say a little bit. But he was here studying politics, and I think there are um, politics students here today. Um, started here in '79, I'm sure, a student, um, and then went on to local to newspapers and to editing a national paper and to all his current situation. So I think I've said enough to give you some sense that if an insight into the current state of the British press could be media. We could not have a more interesting speaker. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over. Welcome to Sus Welcome back to Sussex, Roy. Thank you very much for being here. I wouldn't clap in advance. Um, I, I'm very honoured and delighted to uh, return. Uh, six years on from graduating here, um, I really, really enjoyed my three years uh, that I was here as an undergrad, because um, it was a very different place in those days, very different politically uh, in the 70s, and uh, different industrially, loads of strife, and um, uh, the students, uh, a lot of them, and a lot of the academic faculty uh, imagined that we were on the verge of a socialist uh, revolution. Um, but instead of Marx, we got Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Don't know where we went wrong. Uh, as for me, I also went on to get Robert Maxwell and to get Rupert Murdoch. And in so doing, I became aware of the um, realities of private media ownership and its attendant contradictions. But I'm not going to talk about the past. Um, one of the less glamorous and annoying things is that old journalists love talking about the past. Uh, and I discovered that when I went drinking in Fleet Street pubs in 1969. And one of my earliest visits to El Vino, probably the iconic uh, bar in Fleet Street, where, by the way, women were banned from buying drinks and women were banned from standing at the bar. Uh, this was only in the 1970s, remember. Um, I remember an old soak called Percy Sutton, who used to come in, and after his routine asking for a... Uh, Large brandy and a bolivar, please. Uh, he would then drink for a couple of hours and begin, after he'd had enough, to chunter on. Very strange character, sort of a, a, a club type, a Garrett club type. He wasn't a member of the Garrett club, but he'd stolen it somewhere. And um, shabby navy blazer and so on. And I remember him saying at one point, um, uh, to no one in particular, because he used to speak to no one in particular, because you didn't want to ever get cornered by Percy, he said, I remember, where will I find sympathy in Fleet Street? And some wit at the end of the bar shouted out, look in the dictionary, Percy, it's between shit and syphilis. <laughs> um, uh, that's the last expletive you'll hear from me. Um, I, the person I'm delighted to say, by the way, have passed on. But there are still plenty of people who retail what I call golden age myths about the journalism of the past, and I've discovered over the years that um, the golden age always happened just before you got there. And that's true down the years. Uh, and it doesn't take us 
It doesn't take us anywhere. Now, I, I, I'm, so I'm not going to, I'm not, that's the, that's the end of the past, as it were, unless, of course, um, Ivor attracts me later. For those of you who were here a couple of weeks ago, you will have heard my long-term friend and colleague, uh, Nick Davis from The Guardian, um, talk about his lengthy and successful investigation of phone hacking at the News of the World. He's always at pains, however, to stress that this is not so much just a story about misbehavior by a group of journalists, but it's really about the nature of uh, politics and commercial power in Britain, because that's where it comes from, in essence. And these worlds are intertwined, media and politics. Um, and if you burrow down far enough, you find that they're not really twin elites. They are a, a, a coherent elite themselves, if you burrow down. And I can thank my period here at Sussex for some of that <coughs> insight, because when I was here, I did a course on the linguistics of Noam Chomsky, and then wrote a thesis as my part of my leaving uh, um, degree on the supposed links between Chomsky's uh, transformational grammar and his political philosophy. <laughs> I hope uh, no one can find it in the library. Uh, it would be embarrassing to read now. But Chomsky's understanding about what he came to call the manufacture of consent or the propaganda model has been a guiding light to me in my understanding and analysis of media. And it's just one of the reasons that I found my time here in Sussex so valuable. Without wishing to be pompous, but probably sounding pompous anyway, the whole point of university is to sharpen your critical faculties, and I think uh, that's what it did for me. Um, the fact that I then wasted my time writing headlines for The Sun and The Daily Star and The Daily Express for a couple of years is a different story. What I plan to do instead is to build on that theme I just mentioned about the nature of private newspaper ownership in Britain tending to act, in a sense, in collaboration with the prevailing economic system and the political states that supports it. I always take as my theme, as, as a given, an assumption, if you like, the aphorism coined by A.J. Leadley, which is that the freedom of the press is guaranteed only to those who own one. And that could not be more true here in Britain. If you look at the, at the dramas that happened recently at the Telegraph Media Group, there's compelling evidence there of commercial interference in editorial content. And I'm going to come back to that later. I'm also going to look at the current state of the newspaper industry and look forward to where we're heading as we're carried along on this digital revolution. But I want to start, strangely, that I hope this will make sense. I want to start with the case of Edward Snowden and The Guardian. As you all know, Snowden was the contractor for the uh, National Security Agency in the United States, who blew the whistle in June 2013 by, by leaking loads of classified documents, notably to The Guardian and to The Washington Post. And he exposed the existence of a global surveillance apparatus engaged really in the bulk collection of uh, phone and email information. And they did this through the NSA in the States and through, in Britain, GCHQ. And suddenly a whole new set of words and phrases came to light, became common, metadata, prism, tempora, the dark net, and so on, and we all learned what the encryption was at last. And it was revealed that the NSA was harvesting millions of emails and instant messaging contact lists and tracking and mapping the location of mobile phones. And we learned also that the NSA had access to Google and Yahoo and so on. And he chose to reveal these secrets through two journalists. Uh, Ed, uh, Glenn Greenwald, who was then working for The Guardian, and uh, a documentary maker called Laura Poitras. And they were joined by The Guardian's uh, defense uh, and intelligence correspondent, Ewan McCaskill, and on behalf of The Washington Post, um, Barton, whose name will come to me in a second. But The Guardian was acutely aware uh, of the implications of that story. It had great experience of breaking big global stories, for instance, WikiLeaks, 
uh, in 2010 and ran into immediate criticism for having done so. So, on this occasion, it did share the load with the Post, and together they broke a series of great exclusives. Uh, we later learned the US had spied on 35 world leaders, in court, including, of course, notably uh, Angela Merkel. But Snowden, of course, was quickly denounced by the US government as a traitor. And of course, if he was denounced as a traitor, then unsurprisingly, the Guardian was denounced for being treacherous in giving him a forum and dealing with him. Leading articles in the Daily Telegraph and the Times saw no benefit in the people of Britain knowing that the internet and phone communications that they took as a right of privacy were in fact being compromised. Negative headlines about The Guardian and Snowden became very common in 2013 and 2014. Here's just a brief selection from The Sun, just the headlines. Leaks, an act of treason. Snowden needs to man up and face justice. Edward Snowden is a traitor. Cameron spy rage. Secrets blast at Guardian, and most notably, Guardian treason helps terrorists. That was just a short burst from the sun. Then we had the Daily Mail. They didn't so much as join in as lead the pack. Guardian may face terror charges over stolen secrets. We didn't. Edward Snowden risked UK agents' lives and could have spied for Russia while in the US. He didn't. And I like this, the columnist Max Hastings. Forgive me for not taking lectures on national security from traitors like Snowden, Assange, and their Guardian fan club. And my favourite Daily Mail slur of all at this period, this is a man who's leaked secrets and so on, but the best they could come up with was date night for a traitor, NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden enjoys a trip to the theatre with his pole dancer girlfriend. <laughs> you get the picture. Before I move on, I just want to point out that Greenwald and Poitras and my colleague Ewan McCaskill and the Washington Post's Barton, I've remembered his name now, Barton Gelman, were all given, honoured as co-recipients of a fantastic award, the George Polk Award, and the following year The Guardian went on, never been done by a British newspaper before, The Guardian went on, along in company with the Washington Post, to be given a Pulitzer Prize, a Pulitzer Prize for public service which, as the editor of The Guardian, Alan Rusbridger, pointed out, was that it was significant because he had only, in a sense, acted as, public, as a public servant on behalf of Edward Snowden, who he regarded as having performed a public service. But what was really significant was the way in which Snowden's revelations, whether you agree with him or not, and whether you agree with his methodology and way how he went about it, sparked an amazing debate in the United States, a really important debate about surveillance, secrecy, the right to privacy, and uh, overweening governmental power. And it crossed party lines. In 2014, January 2014, last year, the Republican Party passed a resolution to renounce the NSA's surveillance program and called for a special committee to investigate the extent of domestic spying. But in Britain, in Britain where only really one newspaper took this story seriously, the government and politicians, with some honourable exceptions, including, by the way, some Tories like David Davis, they condemned the messenger, the Guardian, and at the same time ignored the message, put it to one side. Indeed, in December 2013, I sat at a House of Commons Home Affairs Select Committee hearing, sat just behind Alan Rusbridge, who was being questioned by MPs, sometimes very harshly, about his decision to publish that story. And I wrote in The Guardian the following day that the committee's members were split between, between those who understood both the theory and practice of the free press, and those who, even if they accepted the theory, as they did, could not stomach the practice of press freedom. And what I added was, what was remarkable is that the whole thing happened at all. The whole thing being, fancy calling in an editor to explain why his newspaper had reported a world exclusive. The British press obtained its right to freedom of press in the 17th century, and here was 
Parliament calling a newspaper to account for exercising that freedom. And I kept asking myself, why would an editor be required to explain himself to politicians? Do they act, are they there and acting for the people, or are they acting against the people? And I answered that myself by writing our business, by the way, the business of Germans, our business is disclosure. Our justification for doing what we do is informing the public about things they didn't know about. And how could it be wrong to inform the public that you were being, that none of your communications, whatever they were, would be safe from prying eyes? And the questioning really revealed that the MP's version of public interest was and is very different from what we journalists mean by the public interest. We believe in transparency for the public benefit. They believe in secrecy for the public benefit. And sadly, sadly, most of the rest of the press seem to agree with the politicians. I remember shaking my head. I was, I, I was watching Sky, as I do most evenings, I watch the newspaper review on Sky News. And on was the Sun's defence correspondent, Tom Newton Dunn. And I remember shaking my head when he actually said, I could hardly believe it, that he'd sleep easier in his bed not knowing what NASA and Na uh, the uh, NSA and the GCHQ were doing on his behalf. And that his work, he felt, had been compromised by Snowden and the Guardian. I'll come back to Mr Newton Dunn in a second. I also recall that his paper, his paper being the Sun, and other papers were the most hostile to the Snowden leaks. And yet, they were also the ones most hostile to the Leveson inquiry, which had been called, especially after the press inquiry into press standards, which was set up in the wake of the Guardian's exposure of phone hacking. Then we had to take lectures from them on the fact that the Levison settlement, the Levison recommendations about how we, uh, how we would regulate the press, they kept saying, how dare you, we believe in press freedom, nothing will restrict us. A change of mind over Snowden. Another remarkable feature of the Rusbridger appearance before MPs was the lack of coverage of his appearance. Apart from a sort of scuzzy sketch in the Daily Mail, which went on about his hair and how he looks and so on. But outside of that, elsewhere in the world, this was big news. Big interest in states, Australia, Canada, Japan, India, France, Germany, Italy. I scoured the headlines in Britain, hardly any, all bigger headlines abroad. And as I mentioned earlier, The Guardian suffered from criticism from the rest of the press over its revelations of phone hacking. I absolved, by the way, in this, the Independent and the Financial Times. And as you probably know, to take this on a different stage, the other institution that suffered from the hacking revelations was the Metropolitan Police, Britain's major force, because it had failed to properly investigate hacking uh, years before. It meant that its commissioner, and two of its senior executives were forced to resign once the Guardian broke the story in full. And it's fair to say that ever since, the relationship between the Metropolitan Police and national newspaper journalists has been sound. Coincidentally, and here's a clear link to what we discovered in the Snowden leaks, the Met Police, and other forces too, but mainly the Met, have discovered, gosh, that, that Snowden revelation was terrific. I tell you what, Let's do a bit more of this accessing of journalists' phones and journalist data. And irony upon irony, it's amazing, isn't it? The reason we know about this is because guess whose phone they accessed? Tom Newton, the Guardian's a traitor, done. He broke the story in September 2012 about that Tory MP, the government chief, where Andrew Mitchell, who supposedly called a um, couple of policemen at the gates of Downing Street because they wouldn't let him wheel his bike through. He called them, I've got another explanation, please, they're coming, fucking plebs. Anyway, 
It wasn't the plucking that was the problem, was it? No, 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 no. they were upset about the plums. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, I don't know why, by the way, I quite like plebs. But um, when the Met launched an investigation into how Newton Dunn got that story, um, they called him in. Operation Alice, I think it was called. They called him in. And of course, he did what any journalist would do in the circumstances, what any journalist, 99% of journalists would do. He refused to tell them his source. So, unknown to him, the police then thought, well, okay, he won't tell us his source, but I bet we could find out if we access his mobile phone number, which is exactly what they did. And then they thought, but well, we're not getting quite enough from this, so let's access the data of the phone calls into the news desk of the Sun, which they did. They were hunting for sources, and they did it so successfully that they arrested constables on the basis of what they discovered. I'm glad to say they weren't charged, but suddenly... Newton Dunn wasn't sleeping very soundly at night after all. The truth emerged in one chilling sentence in the Operation Alice report, which, by the way, I think was a complete accident. I think that the Met almost didn't realise that that sentence was there. They, they were never going to admit openly that they'd access the journalist's phones, but there in the report was one line. The telecommunications data of Tom Newton Dunn was applied for and evidence. We all went mad. Applied for under what law? Under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, which we know as REPA, which enables an officer of sufficient rank, probably superintendent rank, to give permission to officers to access data. Doesn't need to go anywhere else, just goes to the senior officer and says, look, we've got a tip. Tom Newton done. Uh, we need to get a, is it access. Fine. No trouble with us. When that involves journalists, because they can do this to anyone, but when that involves journalists, it doesn't take a moment to realise how compromising that is. Who is going to phone a reporter with a sensitive story if they can't trust that their conversation with that reporter will not be accessed? Fewer whistleblowers means fewer stories. And fewer stories means less information put to the public in the public interest. Less information means an enhancement of what is already a secret society. After the Newton Dunn discovery, other examples quickly came to light. Essex police had secretly used Reaper to hack into the records of the Mail on Sunday news desk because the Mail on Sunday kept breaking stories about the cabinet, the disgraced cabinet minister, Chris Hume. How did they get them? They had been accessing the news desk phone of the Mail on Sunday. Then six journalists, independent journalists, found out that they uh, were also uh, being monitored. Then the Times found out an extraordinary thing. By accident, Vodafone had sent data, mistakenly, uh, to the police. When the police saw it, what did they do? They knew it had been sent mistakenly, but what they did was they settled down, they went through it all, they created spreadsheets of all the data, and then sent it back saying, oh, I think you said this accidentally. We found that out. And most recently, via a report from the um, Interception of Communication Commissioner's Office, IOCO, it's called, we discovered that 82 journalists had had their communications data obtained by the police under REPA in just three years. Now, although IOCO judged that the police forces weren't, in fairness, randomly trawling, which, by the way, I couldn't imagine that they were randomly trawled, uh, it concluded that the police didn't have to give the question of necessity, proportionality, and, uh, and collateral intrusion sufficient consideration or weight. So, IOCO recommended we've got to stop this. We can't have the police making decisions whether the police will access data, it will have to go in front of a, a judge. I, I, I'm extremely keen on that. I'm keen on it for police bail as well, but it's a different matter. These revelations, however, about the use of RIPA have united the press at last, united the press across the board. All the editors have signed up to a Save Our Sources campaign and petition. 
And it's fair to say the government have made the right noises. Home Secretary Theresa May also agrees that she thinks it's time for reaper, uh, to, uh, reaper applications for data access ought to go before a judge. But it couldn't be clearer that journalism is being compromised. So that's a negative tale. A negative tale. And before I get to a more positive picture, which I will, let me touch then on the Daily Telegraph drama. The Daily Telegraph's chief political commentator, who had resigned in December and was working his notice, by the way, resigned covertly, and we didn't know that he had, but he resigned in December. But it worried away, Peter O'Born, he's called, and he's, he is somebody who, 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 in whom anxiety festers, it's fair to say. Um, and he decided that he would start taking a look at the strange matter of the number of stories about the bank HSBC that weren't being published or were being dramatically downplayed in the Daily Telegraph. And finally, when that huge story broke, about tax avoidance, tax evasion through HSBC's Swiss arm, the only paper not to give it any coverage on the first day was the Daily Telegraph. And Peter went off, as he does, like a bomb, and wrote an amazingly long piece, thousands of words long. Did you read it? Yeah. An Open Democracy? And on the Huffington Post. Group. And Huffington Post, which I don't approve of because they don't pay. But anyway. Um, this gave ten major allegations, major examples, in which he suggested that the Telegraph had editorial content had been influenced, either, either consciously or unconsciously, we don't know, by the fact of what we might call uh, commercial necessity, in other words, to keep advertisers happy. Now, we do know, uh, and it is undeniable, that all newspapers are really uh, facing a crisis of funding, a crisis of attracting advertising revenue. And it's fair to say that advertorial and that kind of material has become more common. But even so, there have been no examples, and uh, I, 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 I some people have been in contact with me and made suggestions about various things, but when I investigated, it's not been very clear that they were right. But there have been suggestions, odd suggestions, where there's been some kind of probably give and take. But not over a major advertiser saying, we will pull our advertising, pausing, they call it, I love that phrase, pausing their advertising, uh, at the time when a big and major news story has occurred. Second day in the Telegraph. Six paragraphs only, when it was front page news on every other serious newspaper. Splash on the Financial Times, splash on the Independent, splash on the Times, splash, of course, in the Guardian. So here was a paper quite clearly, for once, being shown to actually give in to the problems of, of commerce. We can discuss the ramifications of that in a moment. Uh, the most extraordinary leader it published uh, the day after this broke, in which it said, we are now drawing up guidelines but to uh, decide where the boundary should be between advertising and editorial. We have never in all my career in journalism ever needed to have guidelines. It is sacrosanct. We do not accept any attempt to coerce us into doing things via the withdrawal of advertising. When I was on the Sunday Times, Mohammed Al-Fayed, then owner of Harrods, didn't like a story we did. He owned a Paris apartment that was once owned by the Duchess of Windsor, and he was having it uh, um, renovated. And in our newspaper, Sunday Times, we wrote, uh, uh, one of the architectural correspondents wrote a criticism, saying it was pretty shabby, shabbily done. He rang up and said, unless we apologised for that, he would remove three million pounds worth of advertising. And Andrew Neil, the editor at the time, turned it on its head by saying, I'm banning you from advertising. <laughs> I'm banning you from doing it. But then he thought, you better just, just mention it to Rupert Murdoch. 
and Rupert Murdoch um, uh, backed him. Uh, as indeed, I know of another case involving Dixon's advertising uh, at the Times, which was paused because of something uh, their city had patient Sweetcroft had written, and that also was a case where uh, the Times said no, and this was passed on, Murdoch heard about it later, was totally relaxed about it. it when I was on the Daily Mirror, uh, Marks and Spencers withdrew their advertising. And even as maverick and strange and commercially minded a criminal like Robert Maxwell, even he was relaxed about the fact that we had uh, said we weren't uh, kowtowing to uh, Marks and Spencers. So it's been a, just sort of one of those things you just do. So for the Telegraph to do that was extraordinary. And I'm going to finish just to show you what the nature of the internecine warfare in Fleet Street is like. On Saturday morning, I happened to be staying at my daughter's uh, place in a deep valley in Wiltshire where you can't get mobile phone reception. So it wasn't until I drove out of the valley that my phone started pinging uh, with messages saying, for God's sake, have you not seen the front of the Daily Telegraph? And the Daily Telegraph published a story on Saturday. Did you see that story in which they decided that it was to hit back at the Times, uh, that they would publish a story suggesting that um, Times staff were working too hard, evidence there have been two suicides in recent weeks. This was just taking it to a new low. But one of the great advantage of the Telegraph episode is the way that which, in a plural and diverse media, outlets not acting out of spite, but out of genuine public service reasons, can hold, and they're at their best, can hold each other to account. And that make, takes me naturally to the future of journalism. We are in the decline, in a period of decline, of traditional big media, traditional print media. Although it has to be said, it remains in Britain the most influential form of media. It still sets the agenda. It sets the agenda for broadcasters, and you watch in the next two months how the inter-reciprocal relationship which happens between broadcasters and, uh, and uh, newspapers in the run-up to the general election. Um, but the interesting thing we face now is that there are an increasing number of media outlets that never previously existed. Startups, alternative groups, with many, many more opportunities, I'm pleased to say to the students here, for incoming journalists than ever before. There's more invention, more innovation in journalistic formats, especially, I think, hate to use this phrase, I'll use it anyway, for digital natives, as you are known. With that particular skill set, young journalists are in the prime position to plunge into online enterprises that could well in the end supplant the current big medium. All sorts of outlets. You mentioned Huffington Post. Well, at least they do pay the staff who work there. Um, but also BuzzFeed and Vice and Vox and Gorka and Trinity Mirror's got this us versus them and AMP and so on. And others are coming on stream and that's just in this country. There are loads in the state, Politico, Slate, Salon. And then there are the collectives. Very successful collective, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Had a massive hiccup a couple of years ago, but it's done, it's recovered itself since then. And outfits like The Conversation, which retail, which tech get academics to write, uh, journalists to rewrite academics so that their work can be, and their commentaries uh, can get a wider audience. Startups just keep starting up. And I haven't even mentioned local ones. There are more routes into journalism than throughout all my years as a journalist. Now, it's perfectly true that prospects, that many of them are uncertain, but it offers a chance for experience, the chance to experiment in an environment where innovation has become of crucial importance. But I don't want any journalist here, would be journalist, whatever, to think that the ability to code, the ability to mine data, the ability to know how clever you can be at search engine optimization. I don't want you to think that's good enough. Talent is good. These skill sets are good. But there are, firstly, eternal journalistic verities. Getting stories, how to get them ethically, 
how to verify it. Our journalism is just a system of verification. So that's one side. The other side is perspiration. Perspiration, in the end, just doggedly going on and on, is what makes journalism stand out. I'm sure he didn't say it of himself, but that's what makes Nick Davis such a special journalist. And what makes Paul Lewis and others at The Guardian so special. Time and doggedness. Perspiration. And there's an inspirational Canadian journalist called uh, Malcolm Gladwell. You ought to look him up. He's amazing. Who wrote that, and recently, hard work is a successful strategy for those at the bottom because those at the top don't work so hard any longer. It's true. They do get relaxed. There's nothing to be young enthusiasm and, and the willingness to perspire. And finally, just got a moment, I just want to touch on what we might call, as though I'm praising those, those uh, startups, and I'm praising what we face in terms of online journalism, I want to touch on what we might call digital dangers, as outlined by one of my former colleagues, Emily Bell, who's now a professor at Columbia Journalism School's Toast Center for uh, Digital Journalism. She's less worried now by the big media of print than the big media of Silicon Valley, of Google and Facebook and Twitter. She believes, and it's not just a belief because there's plenty of evidence to show it, that Facebook has become the most important conduit for readers nowadays to locate news stories. You go onto Facebook in the morning and there's already a list of what they think you should be reading based on what you've read before. Day after day at The Guardian, I can see how many people through OFAN, I can see how many people come to read my blog. The vast majority once came from the home page of the paper. The vast majority for a while came via Twitter. All that's passed. The vast majority now come through Facebook. But Facebook recommendations don't happen by accident. The lists you see on Facebook, the recommendations, are the result of pre-programming through that mechanism we all now recognize as algorithms. But these don't exist independently of human beings. Software developers created them. And in so doing, they invested those algorithms with a logic in order to compile the list that you see. This is not so different, in a way, from newspaper editors saying, oh, this is an important story, we're putting this on page one, this is not so important, we're putting it on page 44. That's, in a way, uh, that's a human algorithm decision. Algorithms are, con uh, are in fact constructed in secret because they're regarded as commercially sensitive. I don't think we can say this is sinister. Not yet. But down the line, we have to think hard about the way in which these global giants the big media of the digital age are operating and the amount of power and influence that they have. And note also that these, I started off by being, making it clear I was worried about private media ownership and I cited that against The Guardian, which of course is not. It's owned by a trust, which is what makes it so different. But all of these companies, Google, Twitter, Facebook, they're all commercial entities. Google has a slogan that says, do no evil. But it is in fact a behemoth which is really eating, devouring competitors with an efficiency that makes Rupert Murdoch look like some kind of small-time retailer. Between 2001 and last week, Google had acquired 176 companies, including, of course, famously, YouTube which it bought for the eye-watering sum at the time of $1.65 billion. This media doesn't involve itself in acts of journalism. It merely lives off it. Then there's Facebook. Facebook owns 40 companies, including Instagram and WhatsApp. And by the way, it shows you how they're 
is these companies are expanding in terms of their worth or value because it paid for WhatsApp 19 billion. Twitter, 300 million users, acquired 38 companies in its short lifetime. These are media companies that we journalists must now ourselves, in both using them, also hold to account. I say we journalists, but of course I don't mean we, because you and I won't be around to hold them to account. But you will. You will need to think about the challenge, that's your challenge really, to how you can both use digital media, but ensure that digital media owners are not pulling a fast one, and also constrain your constricting freedom. They would like you to think that they are utterly free of any, any kind of journalistic or editorial or political point of view. But you know they've, they've already done experiments in which they can show that if you just twist the algorithms, which they did as an experiment at Facebook, it's surprising how you can change the news agenda on any given day. Anyway, I make that 41 minutes. Spot on. Thank you very much. You ended up on this optimistic note with a warning about how do we pay for journalism without allowing Google, Facebook, Twitter, etc. to actually do the funding of it? Well, I, you know, it's the question that was put, if you recall, uh, at the Cudlip Memorial Lecture to Emily. Mm. And I thought she ducked brilliantly. And I'm going to duck as well. Uh, the answer is, I think we're going to have a mixed economy. We're going to get some money via advertising. We've got to look back to the past. How did newspapers start? Newspapers didn't start as commercial entities. They started largely because philanthropy, it's true, but also largely because people wanted to make, give a message, wanted to make a political point, a social point, a cultural point, and so on. Now, I think it's quite clear that they didn't, in, in no time at all, they realized they needed to fund that and they did it then through advertising as we know. We've got to think about advertising tape being less, we've got to think about forms of sponsorship, and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, in fact, which I mentioned, is in a philanthropic exercise, as is ProPublica in the States, and there are more philanthropists in the States than are in Britain, that's a, a, just a given fact, I'm afraid. But we, we, we can't easily divine a way of doing it. So, some people will say, Rupert Murdoch says, um, and plenty of American newspapers say, well, the best answer to this is perhaps to reduce our audience, but at the same time make that audience pay to go to access, to access online. You presumably paid to go online. Oh, no, 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 I bought a newspaper. You bought a paper. You bought a paper. I paid Shall online. I? Right. Thank but you. plenty of people do pay online. But do you pay for the Times? I pay for I pay for the Times, the Guardian, the Independent, the Financial Times. Isn't oh, you do that, that digital edition. It, yeah, yeah, isn't that sad? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the trouble with the trouble with if you make create what's called a hard paywall, if you do what Rupert's done at all his papers across the states and uh, Australia and uh, and in Britain, is that you lock out a significant number of people, in vast numbers of people. The Sun uh, recently released figures for its subscribers to its, um, to, to its uh, website. Sun Plus, what's it called? Sun Plus, it's called. I am actually paying, I actually do pay for that. Um, <laughs> I know. Uh, but I have to, because I've got to monitor it. I've got to see whether the page three girl is there or not. Um, <laughs> They have 225,000 subscribers. That's, a, that's nothing. That, in the world of online, that's, a, that's, a, that's minuscule. In fact, there are regional newspaper companies across Britain, if you aggregate their online uh, browsers, are greater than the sun is getting uh, to pay. So, uh, and the risk, we, we, we we know the, the Times is less than that. So the risk is that you lock yourself out, not just simply from this vast audience, you lock yourself out from the conversation. 
you know, day on day, when a story breaks, you can read, you can go to Google News and you can see the seven or eight people that have got, and you can read them all. But you can't read the Times. You can't read the Sunday Times. You can't read the Sun. You can't read, uh, and, and you can't read the Wall Street Journal, unless you know the back door, and you can't read the Australian, the major newspaper in Australia. These are locked out. So what newspaper cleverly, the Financial Times pioneered a different model, which is the metered model. So you get X number of um, uh, free goes before, they, uh, before the wall comes down. That's been taken up by most sensible uh, American newspapers, notably the New York Times, which has got a vast following by, by adopting that, and a vast subscribership, by the way, um, where people are in the States where I suppose the New York Times has become the national <coughs> newspaper. They, uh, they've really made a bonus of it, but that's a rather unique situation. Mostly, you have this problem that people expect to be able to have these things for free, and journalism costs. So there is a, there is a terrific problem about how we're going to fund it. So I've ducked the question with a very, very long statement of ducking. Well, there's no other answer. In fact, I asked Emily the same question as you say. Um, just one other question I'll throw over. By the way, that clock is still on summertime. It's five to five, not five to six. Roy's not been talking that long. Um, you ducked a question. I ducked duck another question. You talked about Leveson, but um, we've now got a situation where we have a so-called so press regulator, IPSO, which is backed by the majority of the newspapers. The, the group that actually, where I mentioned the Guardian, the Independent and the FT have refused to join it because they don't think it is, quote, Leveson compliant. But you don't, you don't support um, an alternative Leveson-style press regulator, do you? So no. What's, what's the way forward? Is it, is it Ipso or is it a new body or not? Uh, it, well, there's, there's an alternative coming through called this Impress. But that's Leveson compliant. Mm, up to a point. The point is, you can be Leveson compliant, but it's this final act, which means that you've got to go for recognition under the Royal Charter. And I think that, I think that, well, um, I, I don't know about that, but I, I think uh, our point of view at The Guardian is we want nothing to do with the employers, the publishers, uh, so. Ipso, but on the other hand we want nothing to do with anything which means that the Royal Charter uh, comes into play. So we are standing neatly on the fence, where we feel comfortable, actually. Um, uh, and we are regulating ourselves. I, uh, my hunch, by the way, just to show you that we might get off the fence, my hunch is that the Guardian will go to Ipso in the end. To Ipso, not yeah. Impress? No, it will go to Ipso, I think. Because one of the things that, one of the successes, I mean, there are uh, there's a, two ginger groups, if you like. One is called Hacked Off, which represents the victims of press intrusion and press misbehavior. And the other is a, an analytical group called the Media Standards <coughs> Trust. Between them they brought, although they're despised by the publishers, they, they've an influence out of all proportion, I think, to their eminence. And they have, most importantly, brought pressure to bear on the man, the judge, who was appointed to head Ipsa, um, Moses. Alan Moses. And Moses has really listened and taken on board many of the things they've said. So I think they've had, he has already gone to the to publishers and said, this setup that, you, that I've signed up to being chairman of is not good enough. I want this change, that change, I need extra money to do that, I want to get this arbitration wing off the ground and so on. So he's gradually made Ipsa more Levison compliant and he's in the process of doing that. And I think it might get to the point where the Guardian, possibly, and then I think the Independent would fall in behind it, but the Guardian would then say, we think that uh, Sir Alan Moses has done such a good job, we're willing to go in with that. So I think that is more likely than impress. You heard it here first. Exclusive. Well, I, that's all. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm, it's my hunch. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me throw it open. I saw a hand at the back first. Oh, yeah. Uh, my name is Nick, so I'm a former English lit and American Studies student subject. Oh, right. Which years were you? Uh, I finished well. I finished this year. Oh, right. Okay. Um, I thought you'd look young. In yeah. relation to the lecture you gave today, there's actually a really good copy from 2014 
from the new internationalists that discuss the whole Snowden issue had some titles that uh, don't shoot the messenger, which if right. anyone's interested, I'll say check it out. People's interesting articles in that. Could you speak up? Sure. He's urging us to read the new internationalists. Uh, yeah. Um, my question to you, which you partly answered in as part of the first question, is uh, will the payroll funding model of many newspapers which you listed have an effect on the freedom of the press? I.e. now that uh, newspapers have a far greater awareness of their readership more than at any point in history bar when perhaps they first started, so they know the, the income of their readers and yep. what they read, etc. Do you think that that will perhaps prevent them from running a story in the future because they may not want to dislocate or distance themselves from their readers? So perhaps yeah. if the Daily Mail had a scoop on Prince Andrew and his relationship with a corporate company, uh, they wouldn't run it because they didn't want to distance themselves from their readers. Well, I, uh, that's an interesting question. I, uh, uh, to be honest, um, I think there are plenty of stories that individual newspapers have at various times that they probably don't publish. We, we don't know because they never publish them. But if a story breaks in public, if it's outside of the control uh, of a single editor to restrict it, then a paper that doesn't publish is held up to ridicule, just as the Daily Telegraph has been. Um, but I, but my my... As much as I dislike the Daily Mail, uh, the truth is, uh, by the way, they absolutely publish anything about Prince Andrew, they hate him, but uh, much as I dislike it, I, my view is that very few of these claims about there being safes full of stories that can't be published or safes that contain stories that aren't published is bunkum. I heard someone actually say recently that, that in, in court, a Sun journalist in court said recently that there was a safe with lots of stories in that couldn't be published. I thought, well, you know, it just isn't true. There just, it just isn't the case. We just, tell, we just talk too much, don't we? That, it, it, I, the, the gossip level is just amazing. That's why, by the way, that hacking was never confined to one newspaper, because there's no way that reporters didn't tell their mates, how did you get that story? Oh, guess what? I know this thing. Just ring up this and do it. That's why... <laughs> That's exploded a bit now we know that the, the Sunday Mirror and the Daily Mirror were at it too. Not, so I, time. not under your regime. Uh, no, not on my no, not, well, we didn't. I tell you, I was so, I'm so old as an editor we didn't have mobile phones in my day. Uh, uh, that's absolutely true. Um, but I, but I, I don't think that there'll be, uh, as long as we have a plural media, looking at each other all the time, I don't think that situation could occur. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm the Mahatma from here, Pacific Stadium. But uh, you were talking about like uh, the almost absolute freedom of speech when you were talking about Edward Snowden. But don't you think that there are limits? Like, for example, there is this new Enigma Code movie. Do you think that if Guardian like revealed that something like Enigma Code has been revealed and the information itself would frighten a lot of people. Yes. Do you have to publish it? Right. Well, uh, look, Alan Rosbridger was asked this question by MPs, and it was a question that consistently came up in WikiLeaks and in, uh, and in Snowden's case. And that is, is the publication of any of this material likely to lead to somebody losing their life? Is it putting in peril the lives of spies. And um, we, there was part of the divorce between the WikiLeaks uh, co-founder uh, Julian Assange and The Guardian was over this very matter. Assange was for putting it all out there. The Guardian would have none of it. It wanted it redacted. And that, if, I don't know if anyone was here, but Nick Davis, I'm sure Nick, who was involved in the WikiLeaks along with David Lee, would have mentioned that. Um, it was a problem from the get-go. Because we do believe, uh, and all journalists who go to war and cover wars know this, that you should not do anything which puts anyone in peril. Uh, 
it just would be the wrong thing to do. So the Guardian in the Snowden case, but with Snowden's agreement, by the way, uh, and the Washington Post agreement and the Spiegel's agreement, redacted all possible examples where someone could be hurt. And the interesting thing was, although John Kerry, the Secretary of State, uh, called, and Obama himself, called uh, uh, Snowden a traitor and said that he put people's lives in peril, not a single example, they could have scoured the world, not a single example has ever come to light. So we don't believe anyone died because of what the Guardian did. And that's because of the trouble the Guardian took, but also the trouble in fairness to it, the trouble that Edward Snowden took as well. I don't think you should publish and be damned like Assange does. But the argument is that you as journalists don't know what's going to cause pe put people... No, but I think you can take... I think you're a secret service, so... <laughs> I, think, yeah, I think you can take an informed guess, though. We didn't name people. We didn't name specific people uh, in the field as it were. And also because, don't forget, when the Snowden, the first Snowden revelations occurred, the United States had an opportunity to withdraw people in the field at that point instantly, which I understand some were withdrawn, even though there wasn't a need to. I mean, you must have seen Homeland. I mean, did yeah, you yeah. Like, give time to, to Secret Service or some, someone? Like, did you inform in advance that this is going to be published? No, that's, in a, that's a very good question. No, we didn't. Right. So, um, the, the rule is this, that normally, when you deal with matters of national security, you would go to uh, what's called the D-Notice or DA Notice Committee, device, uh, Defense Advisory Notice Committee, which is under the chairmanship usually of a retired admiral or a retired uh, 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 officer uh, and is chair and uh, includes lots of editors and they would decide uh, whether or not um, this could be published. On this occasion, uniquely, Alan Rusbridge decided not to do it. He decided not to do it um, for practical reasons. He felt confident that, uh, that the material wasn't problematic he felt confident, uh, he felt a lacking in confidence that editors would keep quiet about it, who were on the committee, but he most lacked any confidence that the chairman of the committee would not feel honour bound to tip off the security services. And as you probably know, we went through a farce at the Guardian where um, uh, MI5 turned up and, and ritually smashed um, the hard drive of our computers, which is ridiculous, because we all know we, it was on the cloud, <laughs> it was elsewhere. But anyway, it was quite good for yeah. so I, So, no, we didn't inform them. We didn't feel we should inform them in those circumstances. Uh, it, 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 it is, I, all my journalistic career, that, that bit of it that's dealt with the secret services has always been problematic. They, you, they, they run you, you don't run them, if you're not really careful. And at the Sunday Times, we once published a story on the word of an MI5 source, a name, person we knew, uh, and it turned out to be Bunker. And then he more or less challenged us to say, well, we knew Tom. Okay. And which we libeled Baroness Baxter um, in the story. Just, just like the Iraqi <laughs> intelligence agent misled the government on weapons of mass destruction. Mr. Chilabi. The very same. Mr. Chilabi. Yeah. Um, no, 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 that's the department at LSE you work oh in. Oh, God, yes, I'm It's sorry. you in film. Just music, like... film and music. Um, I okay. wanted to ask, uh, so if advertisers have over a period of time been threatening to pause their advertising, what is it about this particular case that we Is it that HSBC is more powerful than Dixon and Mark and Spencer's or that editors are oh, okay. or Well, I think, I think the, difference, the difference this time was that... Um, that the Telegraph were willing to make editorial judgments uh, based on the pausing of the advertising. In other words, trying to win them back. Um, that was unique in this situation. I also think, to be honest, HSBC's links to the owners of the Telegraph, yeah, yeah. which have been, which have now emerged, is a really important factor. Compare and contrast Barclay Brothers to Rupert Murdoch. 
Barclay Brothers own the Telegraph. Um, I mean, do well, they, are, are they the explanation, if you like? What? I, I, I'm in the properly working press here. You're asking me to put my uh, neck on the line. Um, I, I mean, I believe that it's that it probably wasn't a direct order from the Barclay Brothers to go soft on HSBC. But the Telegraph is run by the, the twin brothers, David and Frederick. David's son, Aidan, runs the Telegraph. He's the main man. There are two things that could have happened. So I'm surmising. Two things could have happened. Either Aidan Barclay, on behalf of his, uh, his uncle and his father, said, don't do stuff on HSBC. That's possible. A direct order which would have gone through the chief executive, Murdoch McClendon. That's possible. The other thing is, and I don't like to think this happened, because I know Chris Evans, who's the editor. I've only met him once, but he seems like a decent guy. Um, and I know him by reputation. The other thing that could happen is that an editor thought, oh, I heard in a conversation recently that HSBC are tied up with the Barclays. I won't put it in. I'll play seven. Now, I personally don't think that happened. I think the much more likely scenario was that either the advertising director or the chief executive acting on behalf of Aidan uh, Barclay gave an instruction. It is extraordinary. It is. It may not be unprecedented, but because these are always the most important thing about the relationship between owners, publishers as they like to be known, and editors, is that their conversations and their relationships are very discreet. So very often you wouldn't know whether something happened. The editor comes down and says, you know, so and so, so and so. It's very unusual it's to set, explain. We know a lot about Murdoch's relationship with his editors because so many of them have written memoirs. Telling us we do. To be, we do. That, now, Murdoch is you know, the interesting thing about Murdoch. I don't want to clear Murdoch's name here. Um, Murdoch did uh, not give in to the blandishments of Dixon's, and he didn't give in to the blandishments of Al Fayed. But what we do know from uh, Andrew Neal's memoirs uh, and so on is that he's very interventionist when it comes to his own businesses. So he, um, he told Andrew Neil to go slow on criticising Malaysia because he had interest in Star TV. Uh, we know that he took the BBC off the satellite in China because it upset the Chinese off his own satellite. So, um, and uh, there are other examples. Well, what we also know is that you know, he will have his view, political or geopolitical views in the paper. So, uh, in, in 2003, I decided to look at every single title remotely owned by Rupert Murdoch, of which there were 175 at the time, to see whether any of them had opposed uh, the invasion of Iran. And I found one. Did you? Mm. Somewhere in the outback of Australia? Papua New Guinea. <laughs> Papua New Guinea. Major, major New Zealand. The only one of the wall. And that's because it didn't know a war was going on. <laughs> now that's just a libel. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, how, yes, I'm David Duff. I'm the oldest trainee journalist in the world. Um, and my question is, I, I'm listening to you really criticising the Telegraph, and I wonder whether aren't all newspapers influenced in some ways by, 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 by outside agencies, and particularly The Guardian, didn't it have, uh, isn't there a big question mark of whether there was some influence there by the Metropolitan Police to stop s stories of corruption in the Metropolitan Police that saw some fine journalists having to leave The Guardian and seek their employment elsewhere. I've heard those allegations. I don't, I, I'm baffled by them because... Um, is this the Michael Gillard? It is, um, yes. This goes back to Gillard, yeah. Oh, by the way, he's got a great book and coming Flynn. out next week. And, so. and, and Laurie Flynn, yeah. yeah. I, I, I know about these allegations because Laurie has explored them with me. I, I know the allegations, but I don't know the details of of Laurie's major complaint. He's bent my ear, but never really fully explained it. Uh, a long time ago. How long ago? 20 years? Uh, no, no, not no, that long ago. That. Four, uh, four or five years ago. No, yeah, no, ten, no, no. Long, 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 anyway, long, a little long. time ago, but not ancient history. No, but still within, under, within, under Rusbridge, uh, within the current editors. Yeah, I, I wasn't time. trying to criticise. I'm just no. saying, isn't there a whole history of outside influence? Uh, what I would say about the Met in recent years, there's been a complete polarisation between The Guardian and The Met because of Paul Lewis's fantastic work on uh, 
on the death of uh, Ian Tomlinson the, during the G8 summit, and uh, also the Guardian's work on Mark Duggan um, in the in the Tottenham riots. So um, I, I wouldn't think that was the case now. But I, but but let's take your general point. Your general point is that there is always pressure on newspapers, Absolutely. and it can come from outside agencies, it can come from advertisers. That is perfectly, I think, true, in the sense that you are constantly, uh, you, you're so influential. The national press has what ten newspapers a day. They command the they command the political uh, agenda day on day. The news agenda is set by newspapers. Broadcasters react to them. They do, of course, get exclusives in broadcasting as well, and I, I will, will tell you that, but most of it is set by these ten newspapers, of which, of course, the most credible, the more credible the newspaper, or the paper with the biggest and largest readerships, are the ones that they, which become hugely important. So you're under, in a situation you're under political pressure, you're under commercial pressure, and other institutions want their voices. So they will always, and, and they deal through individual journalists and so on. And we know historically that journalists have come under pressure from MI5 as well. Um, you know, it seems amazing now to think that the Observer didn't realize they'd hired Kim Philby. <laughs> but, but so that has happened. But getting at the heart of these things, actually having them having the detail and the proof and the evidence is a much more difficult thing to do. I did 40 minutes, but I can do it again. No, <laughs>